Good morning, everybody. Sorry for the close up there. Still trying to get things set up here. So welcome to uh, our next episode of, uh, of Ask the Agronomist. And uh, as I was expecting, a uh, fairly light crowd. We've got exactly zero viewers right now as we uh, as we fire up. So Adam is uh, still getting connected here and uh, we'll get uh, we'll get we'll get going. He had a he had a bit of a delay this morning at uh, at home, and uh, I knew there'd be a short crowd today with uh, lots of field activities going on. A lot of people uh, either planting, replanting, spraying, um, doing field work. Uh, everybody, everybody's uh, all hands on deck. Uh, hopefully, we get some rain this weekend. A lot of areas would uh, really, really, really benefit from uh, from some moisture. And uh, we have several chances coming up here over the next uh, next week or so, and, and hopefully, everybody that wants one gets a gets a shower. So. Planning to spend a lot of time here this morning talking about uh, uh, probably follow up a little bit more on on planting dates and planting timing and how to decide when to plant and are you regretting how much you planted or wishing you planted more uh, uh, ample opportunities to uh, to second guess yourself in, in that arena and then we're going to spend uh, quite a bit of time talking about assessing stands and replant decisions and things that impact stand. Uh, um, stand development and 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 do you get an acceptable stand and what is an acceptable stand and uh, and how do you take those uh, those sort of things into consideration? I will say just as a as a general overall statement, uh, and and you've heard me say this before, uh, these things are not as black and white as as everybody wishes they would be. Uh, it's a lot of personal opinion. It's a lot of gut feel. It's a lot of what seems right to you. And as, and as an agronomist, I can't necessarily say if you feel differently than I feel that, that you're wrong. Uh, it's, it's very much a personal decision when you get into replant decisions. And, and what's acceptable for one person is not going to be acceptable for everybody. And we don't know on, on any given day um, what the yield potential of a old stand is nor do we know what the yield potential of a new stand is because we don't know what's going to happen throughout the rest of the season that's probably going to be more of a yield limiting factor than what you're looking at in the field at the time you have to make those replant decisions. So it's it's not an easy call. Uh, you you, you got to do what feels right to you. And, and typically, once you make that decision, regardless of what decision you make, you will feel better. Uh, the agony over what to do uh, is 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 often worse than you know. Once you decide what you're going to do, just just live with it and, and move on. And generally, you you will feel better. So, uh, again, welcome to everyone that's uh, joining live. And if you do have questions, please please ask them. Um, we I didn't uh, kind of regret it after our last episode. I, I didn't do uh, as good a job as I usually try to do to encourage people to ask questions. So. Uh, that's my favorite part here on Ask the Agronomist is to answer your questions. I know Adam's got some stuff. We, we've kind of talked ahead of time about uh, questions he's been fielding from customers. And, uh, and, and even when you guys don't ask questions here live, typically I'm getting my FSRs feeding stuff to me based on, well, here's what, here's what uh, people are asking me in the field. So, so hopefully everything we talk about is, uh, is relevant to you. But uh, probably more likely it will be relevant to you if it comes from you. So uh, please ask those questions. So anyway, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and kick off with uh, with just a, a little bit of a weather update. And uh, we, we had one more cold night. So hopefully last night was the last of the cold nights. Uh, I was a little surprised when I went out early this morning uh, to check a couple fields before heading to Macomb. Um, it was 34 degrees in the Spoon River Valley uh, this morning, and I had a little bit of light frost in the, in the bottom of the road ditch in, in a few places. So now by the time I was at 530, by the time I rolled into Macomb at about 640, it was 44 degrees. So it was 10 degrees warmer. Now, I don't know if it was just not as cold overnight in Macomb, and I know things are warming up fast. So, you know, we had a we had another cold night. Um, that, that reminds me of something that you may see in your corn. I've had a few calls, people that f found some corn the last couple of days looked like it was newly frosted and wondering what was going on with that. That's not frost, that's uh, sand blasting. 
So if you uh, if you remember the two windy days and all the dust that was in the air, um, that that's pretty abrasive. And uh, it w- wouldn't be unless you're in Mason County. Probably wasn't sand blasting. It was probably silt blasting. If you want to be uh, accurate about it. But uh, all those dust particles in the air that obvi- obviously caused the horrific accident on I-55 uh, due to a lack of visibility, uh, that's very abrasive. And, and just the wind whipping those corn leaves around just beat the you-know-what out, uh, out of those seedling corn plants. And so they are going to look like they were frosted. Uh, they're going to have dead leaves on them. They're going to have dead tissue. Um, you know, and I've seen corn li- literally almost get cut off at the ground by, by sandblasting when it's, when it's really bad on, on sandy soils. So if you're seeing some, some dead leaves in your corn, or it just looks really, really, really ratty, um, that that's probably the cause of that. So I've had a couple calls on that. So just while that was on my mind, I thought I thought I'd mention that. So, so anyway, been, been a lot of talk, um, this spring about, when to plant, when not to plant. Everybody's got their theories. Um, you know, nobody's probably going to be convinced that their theory is is less accurate than anybody else's theory. And and we have people that were aggressive early planters that have beautiful stands of corn. We have people who were aggressive early planters who are replanting horrible stands of corn. We have people that were a little more patient that their corn isn't up yet. They don't know whether it's it's going to be a good stand or not yet. Uh, we have people that were, were so patient, they're still planting corn. Um, I know several producers that they, they did a third early, a third in the middle, and a third late, um, just kind of hedging their bets. I, I personally, I, I kind of like that philosophy. Um, it, it, it may or may not work out for you, but, but they, they had a rationale behind what they were doing. And, and whether you're happy with your corn stands or not, has a lot to do with geographically, where are you? You know, how far south, how far north? I imagine most of Adam's early planted corn looks looks pretty nice. Uh, as you go south, he's, he's nodding his head yes. Uh, you get into my territory, as you go north in my territory, um, there really isn't any corn that looks great. Um, you know, some's better than others. Uh, some is, is n- no doubt needs torn up and redone. Uh, some looks pretty good. Some's kind of in that gray area where it's where it's difficult to decide. I've looked at emerged fields of corn in the low twenties for final stands, where it's a no brainer that it needs to be replanted, and and there's going to probably be a lot in the high twenties, low thirties, which is kind of kind of no man's land really when you're trying to make that decision because that's that's technically leavable, but it's sure not as good as you'd like it to be. We are still in the, you know, believe it or not, we're still in the 100% yield window for planting. Um, technically, we're in the 99% yield window for planting, but I'll, I'll round that up to 100. And, you know, th- that, that may be hard to believe. Some of you may think, oh, that, there's no way in hell that, that uh, corn planted May 4th can be as good as my April 15th, April 20th corn, you know. A lot of research says that it is, you know, you can believe that or not believe that. But uh, if if you don't think that May 4th corn can compete with April planted corn, that's something you should factor into your replant decision. So if you if, if you think April planted corn has a big advantage over May planted corn, then you're going to lean towards wanting to hang on to a maybe less than perfect stand of that original planting. You know, if in your opinion, heck, if I get it in by May 10th, I I think May 10th corn can beat April corn. If that's your philosophy, then you're probably going to lean more towards replanting. And normally, you know, we're replanting a lot later than this. And so you're, it's pretty, it's a little bit uncommon to have an opportunity to replant while you're still in the 100% yield window. But that's where we find ourselves right now, and that's where we will find ourselves for a few more days, in my opinion. And so if it stays dry, um, you're, you're going to have opportunities to replant and still have very, 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 very good yield potential. And so that's going to make me, I guess, a little more aggressive about maybe making a replant recommendation than I normally am just because I know we still have very high yield potential. Now, another factor to to work into your equation 
we've got plenty of variables already, but one more to throw at you is what's available for replanting. Um, if the hybrid that's available for replanting is genetically inferior to the one that you planted the first time, you know, if you're trying to gain 10 or 15 bushel of yield potential by having a better stand and you lose 10 or 15 bushel of genetic potential by planting a lesser hybrid, you're kind of spinning your wheels there. Um, I, the, the FSRs always love it when the TA start talking about supply and availability. And, and I, and I know Adam stumbled across the, you know, a little, a little pile of gold the other day at a, at a dealership that had some extra of something. I won't, I won't name the hybrid because he's probably already committed it to 18 people, but, uh, but there's, there's, there's good seed out there for replanting if you need it, but it may not be the same hybrid you planted the first time. So did you have a question, Adam? It looked like you were studying something there. No. no okay. No. All right. So we'll, we'll just kind of continue on here. And, and Adam and I have got some, some things that we've discussed uh, already, but if you have <laughs> questions, please get them, uh, get them in the chat. So, so I would say, you know, if you look at, uh, I brought my Purdue guide here and there's there's lots of different editions and versions. This one's a little dated. It's a 2019 edition. So that's getting a little old. But in the in the 2019 edition, the, uh, the, the, the magical planting date population chart happens to be on page 56. And it looks like that. So you've all seen that before. And, and if you look at that chart, it goes all the way out to June 9th for corn planting dates. Hopefully that's not relevant to this year. And the basically the 99% um, window, you know, starts on April 20th, according to this. So according to the Purdue guide, if you plant corn before April 20th, it will yield less than planting corn on April 20th. Now, I know most of you think that's BS. Uh, but that's what the data says. So you can choose to believe it or not. And probably why that is, is because, you know, the earlier you plant, typically your odds of getting a perfect stand are statistically not as good. Now, I know many times, and I would say this year's one of those, the best stands of early corn are the earliest early corn. Adam's nodding his head. So it's, you know, the, the stuff that went in before Easter and in Adam's territory and Chris Callow's area to the south of me, the stuff that went in the week of Easter is, is probably the best. Now, in my territory, even the Easter week stuff isn't very good. And there was no before Easter stuff to speak of. So, you know, I kind of missed out on, on the good part of the early planting. And, uh, and it depends on lots of things. I mean, as you go north, it's colder. You know, we talk about that a lot. And, and you may look at what's going on on the I-72 corridor, even if you're on the I-74 corridor, and you may have the same soil conditions, and you may have the same desires, but you don't have the same weather. And, and there's a big difference between 74 and 72 in the spring as far as temperatures. And, and it just keeps changing as you, as you go north. And so, you know, it, temperature is a, is a big variable. Rainfall is a big variable. There's places that are, are begging for moisture. There's places that have had four inches of rain since they planted. If you're in one of those places that had four inches of rain since you planted, you've probably got crusting. You had situations where you had saturated soils. You may have heard about something called the saturated cold seed test. Well, some people have been performing their own version of the saturated cold seed test on their farm. Other people, have just been doing the dry cold soil seed test, which you've never heard of, right? The, the, it's, that's not that stressful. So, so there is no such thing as the dry cold seed test because that wouldn't be a very stressful test. There'd be no point in doing that. So they say store your seed in a cool, dry place. Well, that's what a lot of you have been doing. And, and it will, I've gotten lots of questions about, well, how long can it survive? How long can I wait? How, you know, my, my corn's been in the ground for three weeks and it's not up yet. Should, it, should I keep waiting? Well, if it's been cool, which it has been, and relatively dry, that's going to extend the, you know, the amount of time that that seed can survive, you know, before emergence. When it's warm and wet, it's going gonna, it's gonna to die the fastest. When it's cold and wet, it will die the second fastest. 
And when it's cold and dry, you know, that will extend the amount of time that that seed can survive under the soil. So if you've still got seedlings that, uh, you know, have not emerged, but they look healthy, they're good color, they're not leafing out underground, you've still got a good tip on the spike, um, and there's not a bad crust, you know, you, you should be patient and continue to let that crop emerge. And, you know, hopefully we will get enough heat units and we'll talk about heat units at some point here this morning and, and lack thereof. There's really nothing wrong with any of this seed that hasn't come up per se, other than it hasn't received enough heat units to emerge. And we've had a lot of days the last three weeks where we've had less than five heat units a day. We've had several days the last three weeks where we got a big old goose egg for heat units. And so if you do the math on, let's say we've been getting an average of three per day, that's going to take 40 days for corn to emerge at three heat units per day. Now, we've had days where we got more than three heat units. If you had your corn in the ground that week after Easter, it got quite a few heat units those first, you know, and, and the more good days it had before it got bad, th that's a good thing. So, so if you planted corn the week after Easter, what, help me with the dates, Adam. What was Monday after Easter? 11th? It was 10th. 10th, okay. So Monday the 10th would have been a day that a lot of people started planting. And then the following week would have been Monday the 17th. Correct. So, so if you planted on Monday the 10th, you had about six warm days. If you planted Monday the 17th, that seed hadn't had one good day yet. You know, there, there was no warm soil after Monday the, the 17th. And so if you're far enough south, stuff planted this week of the 10th look, looks really good. If you're further north, early that week is better than late that week. And where it stayed dry is better than where it's been wet. Um, there, there's a lot of corn that's being considered for replant that was planted that week of the 10th in my geography, not so much in Calvin's because they had enough heat there those first few days. That stuff was almost up before things got bad and, and that gave it a big advantage. There's not much that was planted that following week that, that's up yet. And, and a lot of that stuff has made scary little amount of progress since planting and has a long way to go to get up. Now it might be fine, but it's gonna be another week plus in many cases before that seed emerges. And so it's gonna be in the ground a long time before it comes up. Now that doesn't mean that you won't get a good stand, but if there's a crust or any disease issues, um, you know, that that stuff's gonna really, really, really struggle. So so most people are, are, are fixated on this week of April 10th stuff because it's what's up and you can see it. And if you don't like how it looks, you're dealing with that now. People aren't talking too much about the, the following week corn, the week of the 17th. That that stuff could be worse, I think, than the, than the week of the 10th. Um, but it's going to take a little more time before we know. So, <clears throat> so anyways, you're trying to make these decisions you know, according to our trusty Purdue guide, which, you know, the, the Illinois has got data that's slightly different than Purdue's. It's not enough different to matter. I actually made a hybrid chart one time, which kind of averaged the Purdue and U of I data that probably violated data policies at two universities when I did that. Uh, but they're, they're similar enough. I, I don't consider them to be significantly different. But, but I'm looking at the Purdue guide here. So, so basically, their, their 99% plus yield window goes from April 20th to May 5th. So we are what? May 4th. So, so basically, if you're able to replant now, I'm, I'm going to say now is as good as any time this spring. For a lot of people, now would be better than any time this spring. Adam kind of facetiously asked me a question the other day as we were kind of preparing for this is, should I have waited till May to plant my corn? Well, it's a little late to say that now. It's, it's uh, you already planted it in most cases. So, um, you know, hindsight's always 20-20. Uh, if you're replanting corn, you probably wish you would have waited. If you're not replanting corn, uh, you're happy you planted when you did. A and I'll, I'll back, back to this conversation. If you're replanting corn, you planted the, the week of, of May 10th. <laughs> I don't know 
to me, until maybe now, there hasn't been a better time to plant corn than the week of May 10th. So if your May 10th week planting failed, you would have had to have waited till basically now to start, which would have probably driven you insane in, in most cases. So that's not good either, driving yourself crazy. So I, I made a point to a grower the other day. He was he was reading way too much information um, about, you know, chilling, imbibitional chilling, cold soils. And, and had himself, um, you know, paralyzed to do anything. And I, and I made the point to him. I said, you know, I said, I, I see a trend. Most of the agronomists and the experts that, that like to tell people you probably shouldn't plant, they don't have anything to plant. And it's a lot easier to make that recommendation when you don't have 500 or 1,000 or 5,000 acres of corn to put in the ground. The reality is you got to plant at some point. And, and we can look back in hindsight and say, oh, yeah, you shouldn't have planted then. There's always days we say that. Every year, there will be two or three days. This year, there could be two or three weeks for some people, unfortunately, wh wh where, yeah, it would have been better to have not done that. But we, you don't know what's going to happen in the future. And, and if you waited to, you know, let, let's say you decided that today was the day to start. And it rains for two weeks, starting in two days, and then you're planting in soil that's too wet in late May, you know, that that would have ended up being a, a bad decision. And those things happen. And the, and the other thing that I'm critical of, of, of some people about is they, they talk about the risks of planting without giving any thought to the risks of not planting. It's almost like the only risky thing is planting. Well, not planting is equally risky. So you can't just say, oh, well, you shouldn't plant because it's risky. Well, what about the risk of not planting? So you got to consider that too. Um, you know, there's every year we're going to replant some corn. This year, some people may replant more than normal. I mean, I've talked to several guys that they're, you know, they're pretty beside themselves. They haven't replanted corn in 30 years. And they're replanting whole fields, you know, and that's really bothering them. Um, and, and they're thinking they did something wrong. And they and in most cases, they did not do anything wrong. Now, I have been in some fields where the guy tells me before I get there, oh, it worked up beautiful. Conditions were perfect. And based on the soil I see walking through the field, it looks like it was a little wet when it got worked prior to planting. And it looks like it was a little wet when it was planted. So we had a lot of really, really, really good soil conditions. But if you pushed it a day or two, earlier than you should have, oh, didn't silence my phone. Um, you know, that that's a factor, you know, that determines how much crusting you get, that determines, you know, how good a seed to soil contact you get, that determines how hard does that soil get around that seedling as it's trying to emerge. So, so we've had a lot of really, 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 really good soil conditions, but you know, I have been in fields that we were probably on them a couple of days too early in, in that early window in some cases. And, and that's definitely going to going to play a role. But, you know, basically what we're trying to do with, with our chart here on, on planting date is we're trying to determine is the 30,000 that I've got, you know, so if let's 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 talk real world numbers here. Adam likes it when we have real world examples. <clears throat> so here's here, here's the way it typically goes. You planted thirty six thousand, expecting to get thirty five thousand. You've got thirty thousand, let's say, and the question is, is that good enough? Now, the first thing you're going to say is, well, Lance, if I if if you tell me thirty thousand is enough, that's okay. That, that's your opinion. But if I'd have wanted 30,000, I wouldn't have planted 36. I don't want 30. I want 35. I, I get that. You don't have 35. Now, you can replant and try to get 35. Now, now the problem there is there's no guarantee the replant's going to be perfect either. We've had some early May planting windows that were horrible in the past few years. So, so if you tear up 30,000, go on for 35 and end up with 27, you know, you're not going to be very happy about that. So that's a, that's a reality. That's a, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of Donald Rumsfeld as I'm talking here. That's a, that's an unknown unknown. 
And uh, and I and I like the unknown unknowns, and they are real. So people who made fun of him for saying that don't understand it. But anyway, so so the, you've got skips and gaps to consider. So the reality is, if you've got thirty thousand that struggled out of the ground, it's never going to be perfectly uniform. You're going to have variation in plant size. You're going to have variation in spacing. We know both of those things impact yield, but I'm going to talk about how they might not impact your yield as drastically as you might perceive. So, so in my opinion, the the three the, the three things you're trying to achieve with a stand is you want you want plants, you want uniformity, and you want spacing. That's what you want. And you want perfect all three. And your planter, you know, as you're driving through watching the monitor, you're paying attention to those things and your planter is telling you how good you're doing. And, and the planters are pretty smart these days and, and they are, they're going to give you numbers. And sometimes the number is red if it's bad. And sometimes the number is yellow if it's okay. And you want it to be green. Uh, that means it's really good. But I, I've got these written in order of importance, in my opinion. So, so the first thing you need to achieve is an adequate number of plants. If you've got that, that's the first box checked. So I'm going to say an adequate number of plants is 30,000 based on how early we are. Now, the chart would say, and, and some of you will, you'll really come up for air on this one. You know, how, how many of you believe that corn planted April 30th, with a final stand of 26,000 plants has 99% yield potential. I'm guessing almost nobody believes that. Now, that's what the data says. You can say that's BS. There's a lot of data behind that. Um, and, and, and there is a lot of variation in these studies. And when you do 10 studies and average them together, the range of the results of those 10 studies is going to be huge, but we'll average them together to make that average number. On the average, based on the studies that were conducted, 26,000 final stand planted April 30th gives you 99% yield potential. So if you believe that, your number should not be 30, it should be 26,000. Now, I, I'm going to say that it's going to be hard for some of you to achieve the yield that you're looking for with a final stand of 26,000. So, so I'm going to use 30. Your number might be 28. Your number might be 29. Your number might be 27. That's fine. Now, I would say if your number is higher than 30, you might be making a mistake. So, so we need to be careful tearing up stands that have 30,000 or more plants per acre, in my opinion, even if they're uneven. And, and we'll go into the uniformity and the spacing part next. So, so the first thing is you, you got to have enough plants. And we talked about what's enough and your number is going to be different than, than somebody else's. Uniformity is the difference from plant to plant to plant to plant down the road. Now, if you got a 80 here, in this corner, nice and dry, and the plants are V2. And this corner is wet, and they're spike. And in the rest of the field, they're, you know, spike to V1. That doesn't bother me in the least. Not in the least. I, I don't think that's hurting a damn thing. Now, would it be better if they were all V2? Sure. You know, would it be better if I own better ground? Yes. That's not the case. So, so, so that kind of lack of uniformity isn't even worth talking about. Don't call anybody. Don't complain. Don't worry about it. Don't stress about it. It's fine. That's just soil variability causing differences in emergence. Now, where, where we get a little concerned is if you've got spike, V2, V1, spike, and, and maybe one that's not, not, even, not even up yet plant to plant to plant to plant down the road. Now, now that, that hurts a lot more than this. This does not hurt as much as a lack of plants. So, so at some point, um, more plants will, will be better than having perfect uniformity. So if you've got 30,000 plants that are uneven, that'll probably beat 
27,000 plants that are uniform. But 30,000 uniform will beat 30,000 non-uniform. So, so uniformity does matter. Spacing matters the least, and my apologies to the equipment industry when I, when I say this, you know, if, if you're missing one here or there, or you got a double here or there, or you got a foot long gap here because one didn't come up, but they're all the same size, it's going to be really hard to measure a yield loss with, with that. So, so some of these planter monitors that are, you know, smarter than I am, when we're going for that 99 point something or other, you know, singulation, it's going to be really difficult to ever prove that that is what's going to determine, you know, the final yield of, of your field, because there's going to be something else happen that's probably going to be more impactful to your yield than what your singulation was. So, so my, my order is you got to have the right number of plants, get them as uniform as you can. If you can space them right, that's, that's, that's the gravy on top. But if you got to give up something, I'd give up spacing first. I'd give up uniformity third. And the one that we just really can't give up is we, we, we've got to have enough plants. So, so let's talk about this plant to plant. Um, uniformity a little bit. So, so how many of you have ever heard someone say, you may feel this yourself. You may have said this yourself. If it's two leaves behind, it's what? Adam? Weed. A weed. Okay. There is not any data that I'm aware of that would support that. The data, and you know, it's a lot of it's the same data that made these charts. So if you don't believe these charts, you may not believe the data that we're going to talk about here either, but it's it's the best there is. What, what university, university researchers determined was that once a plant is two leaves behind, that's when sig sig statistically significantly noticeable yield loss is occurring. So that doesn't mean that plant that's two leaves behind is a weed. That means it's going to have a smaller ear than its neighboring plant that is two leaves ahead. Now, is it going to have two thirds of an ear? Is it going to have half an ear? Is it going to have 80% of an ear? That depends on a lot of variables. It depends on the population. Uh, if you're if you're at 44,000 and you're Kevin Kalb and you got a decent chance of winning the NCGA yield contest, Plant-to-plant -plant variability will ruin your chances of winning the NCGA yield contest because you're going for 400-plus bushels. If you're Lance Tarchione, who's going to be pretty happy if his corn makes 240, that's not an issue for Lance Tarchione, the same way it is for Kevin Kalb. And, and all of us want to be the Kevin Kalbs of the world, and so we all try to learn from those guys, and we all try to adopt their practices. But what they do and, and what they're trying to achieve is relevant to the world that they live in. And if you're living in a world where you're trying to grow 400 bushel corn, things matter that do not matter to those of us who are raising 240 bushel corn. Now, that doesn't mean they're wrong. That doesn't mean we shouldn't strive to achieve the same level of uniformity that, that they have. But we put, I think, too much emphasis on spacing and too much emphasis on uniformity, thinking that it's going to make a huge difference in our yield. And in most cases, the things that make a huge difference in our yield are A, the weather, B, diseases. If, if your plants get crown rot and die two weeks before black layer, how much difference you think it's going to make if the spacing was perfect and the uniformity was perfect? when you're losing 50 bushel of yield because it died before black layer. So there are things that happen, you know, what happens if we have a flash drought 10 days after pollination and we lose the kernels off of a third of the end of the year, you know, you think that's going to be more of a yield determining factor than your spacing and your uniformity of your plants. Yeah, absolutely. It will be. So there's, there's generally things that happen. Now, when, when you're controlling all those variables, when you're feeding that plant everything it needs, when it's irrigated, when you're trying to control the weather, when you're trying to raise 400 bushel corn, 
you know, all these things start to become yield limiting because you're able to eliminate the larger yield limiting factors out there in the world. Most of us in the real world can't eliminate the other yield limiting factors that, that end up being a bigger deal than things like plant to plant uniformity. So, so do I want plants in a field that are two leaves behind? No. Is the field going to yield more because they're there? Yes. You know, if you went in and cut them all out, your field would yield less than if you left them there. They, they are not truly a weed. They are a lesser corn plant that's going to have a lesser ear, but it's better off having two thirds of an ear than being a skip with no ear because the plants on either side of it, if that plant was gone, are not going to flex out enough to more than make up for, for that plant being there. So if, if I've got 30,000 plants that are varying two leaves in size, but they're healthy, I, I'm not tearing that field up. Now, you might want to. You might choose to. That's okay. It's a personal decision. But I'm not going to tear that field up. Now, if I've got less than 30, and especially if it's very ununiform and variability in size, you know, then I'm going to lean towards tearing that field up. Um, you know, and as that number creeps up, you know, so my number's 30, you know, your, your, your number, if it's, if it's greater than 30, you know, I, I, I would question that. So I know you plan at 36. I know you're not happy that you got 31.5, but tearing up 31.5 and replanting a perfect 36 probably is not going to increase your yield potential enough to justify the time and effort expense and, and risk of, of doing that. But, you know, opinions will vary on that. And we talk so much about spacing. We talk so much about population. We talk so much about uniformity. We have you all convinced that your corn's going to be crap if you don't have a thick, uniform, even stand. That's not the case. I had a guy tell me the other day that, you know, he heard somebody say, and I, I just, this, this about made me mad. It was just not, not what he said, but the fact that somebody told him this and, and somebody that ought to know better. They made the statement that, well, you know, what you're doing is okay for 200 bushel corn, but if you're trying to grow 300 bushel corn, you, you can't do that. Well, that's overly simplistic. You know, he was talking about the, 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 co the comment was made relative to planting date, planting in the cold soils and imbibitional chilling as if that was going to cost him 100 bushel a yield. That's ridiculous. Um, to, to raise 300 bushel corn, and yeah, is it easier to raise 200 than 300? Absolutely. But but to raise 300 bushel corn, you got to do a lot more different than just planting date. You know, there's a whole system of high yield, and and planting date might be a piece of that. But but planting your corn um, when the soil is a little bit cold versus not planting the corn when the soil is a little bit cold. This guy thought that meant imbibitional chilling was going to cost him 100 bushel a yield. And so based on that, he's like, oh, I got to wait. I got to wait. Well, what if it costs you three bushel of yield? Well, I don't want to wait. Oh, well, OK. That's probably closer to reality than, than the 100 bushel figure you got in your head. So <clears throat> so you, you hear things, you read things, people say things. Um, you know, you, you, you got to you, you got to use your, your, your own noggin sometimes and and, and do what you feel is right. And, and, and what's right and what's wrong is, is more opinion than, than fact in, in some of these situations. So as we're making these replant decisions, and I know they're painful, and, and, I, and I hate spotting in fields, you know, if you're going to replant, tear out the old, either tear out the old stand or spray it out. You know, we do have some guys that are replanting with smart stacks because they had non-smart stacks the first time. So you can, in theory, kill that non-smart stacks decalb corn with an application of Liberty, replant with smart stacks, not have to work the ground, conserve your moisture, not mess up your herbicide program. Um, it, 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 there are advantages to not working the ground. Um, I, I like to not rework it if, if I can. Um, you know, the easy way to get rid of the crop is with tillage. Uh, assuming it's the right kind of tillage. Don't use your vertical till tool. Don't use a soil finisher an inch and a half deep. You're going to have to get a real field cultivator that was made for weed control. That corn crop that you're trying to kill is now a weed. 
and a vertical tillage tool is not designed for weed control, that's not going to get that old crop out of there. You know, that corn that almost died because of the weather, you'd be shocked at how t resistant it is to tillage if you, uh, if you don't use the right tool to tear it out. And I've seen guys that have decided to replant a stand that was probably close to leavable, and then they only kill about a third of that when they work the field, and then they plant 35,000 into 20,000 and end up with a succotash mess. So don't, don't, don't get yourself in that situation. You'd have been better off to have walked away from the field and kept what you had the first time versus ending up with that. So if you're going to remove the original stand, you got to do that. If, and I'm sure this is going on as I say this, if your plan for replanting is to thicken up what you got, stay the hell out of the field. That is not a good plan for replanting corn. Now, if the field is a complete bust and there's like 2,000 scattered plants per acre, that's okay. But you can't plant half a rate into half a stand. All you're doing there is giving yourself some weed control. And, and, and do this experiment for me. If you choose to do that, leave a little area of that field where you don't replant it. And at the end of the year, I'll bet you a steak dinner, the part that you didn't replant will yield more than what you thickened up. Now, you might not believe that. And this is another part of the chart that you won't believe. So, so would you believe that 10,000 plants planted on April 30th will give you 68% of your yield? I doubt you believe that. I, I do. You know, and, and Adam knows that 60 pounds of nitrogen will give you about, what, 80% of your yield, probably, yeah, sometimes, some, yeah. sometimes more. Yeah, sometimes you don't believe more. that either, but he's done a lot of work on that. And, and, and I know that's true. So, so the, you know, the first half of something gives you way more than half of the, of the end result. That's just the way it works. So, so that, that data is not completely bogus. <clears throat> so <clears throat> and I, I think that's good yeah. to point out, Lance, the, what to do is a much more difficult and situational thing to determine. But right. I think it's very good that you right. point out what not to do. Yeah. Yeah. The the corn stand that you're talking about going in and planting into it, that is yeah. big time no no. Yeah. That's something that yeah. you should definitely avoid. What about in beans? Yeah. We got to talk about beans just a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Yeah. And I and I think that while we're on that subject, I I do consider that to be an acceptable sin in soybeans. Now, it, it's probably better to start fresh with those, too. Um, but let's say we, we've got several situations out there <clears throat> where beans went into dry ground. Yeah. Sitting there in dry ground. Yeah. Not doing much. Don't have a broken neck. Yeah. Should we be going out there? And if we planted, let's just say the guy was planting yeah. 140,000. Should we be going out there? Because we're anxious yeah. and planting in yeah. to beans that aren't dead. Yeah. They're, they're, so, so you're talking about a preventative replant. Correct. Basically. Correct. Yeah. So so could could you, if you tried hard enough, could you find a situation where that would be the right thing to do? Probably. If you try to do that, I think nine times out of ten or more, you're you're unnecessarily replanting that field. Now, is putting another 60,000 seeds out there going to kill you or ruin those beans? N no. Um, is it going to increase your yield? Probably not. You know, could it decrease your yield if they all come up? Possibly through too much lodging. <laughs> Just kind of depends. But my rule of thumb on soybeans is, and, and corn, corn is actually probably easier than beans. Corn, as soon as it leaves out underground or no longer has a spike, I, I'm okay giving up on that because that ain't coming up. Um, if it's still got a spike and it's still got a good point and it's still headed straight north and it's not rotten or mushy or doesn't have any disease issues, it needs to be left alone and given a chance. Now, you can rotary hoe it if you want. We can talk more about that. I, I, don't, I don't mind a rotary hoe. I think they get misused because they get used too late. Typically, if you're going to hoe, you need to hoe on the early side. And the way most people do it is they don't want to do it. They don't want to do it. They don't want to do it. They finally decide, well, damn it, I got to do it. And, and they go do it. 
and it does nothing because they didn't do it soon enough. And it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh, I knew that damn thing wouldn't do any good. I'm not doing that again. Well, if you'd have done it five days earlier than you did it, it would have done more. Now, would it have saved the stand? Not always. I, I, I could have Derek Strubing come on. Derek's one of our CBAs, does a little bit of organic production. You know, he runs a rotary hoe like three times just for weed control. So, I mean, he he hoes perfectly good corn for weed control. And, and, and he could tell you, you know, how much damage a hoe does not do to corn. So if you're not hoeing because you're afraid you're going to hurt your corn, you know, if the field needs hoed, you will do more good than harm with a hoe. Uh, I don't know that I've ever seen a situation where I thought harm was being done, more harm than good was being done. They're either neutral or positive, in my opinion. We should probably hoe more often. I get it. You're busy. You're planting other corn. You're planting beans. You're spraying. You got stuff going on. Uh, your hose buried in the shed or your hose a piece of crap. Um, you know, it, it, it's a pain. I, I get it. I understand. I'm, I'm, I'm the same way. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't probably do it more. Um, I digress so much. I forgot what I was initially talking about, Adam. We were talking about soybean population, <laughs> I guess. Soybean so, and, you know. so, and, and how to, so how to decide when to give up on a bean. So I, I give up on a bean um, for two reasons. It's, it's rotten or it has broken its neck. If it is not rotten and its neck is not broken, I don't care how swollen the neck is. I don't care how weird you think the color is. If, if it's yellow, white, yellowish, white, greenish, yellowish, white, anything but brown or black, it's okay. And, and if the neck is twice as fat as you think it ought to be, it's okay. As long as it's not broken. So until they're broken or dead, I think we should give them a chance. Now, if you go out there and proactively do a preventative replant, like Adam was asking about, that planter is going to work like a really good rotary hoe, and it's going to help that initial stand come through. And you're probably going to get 90% of what you planted the first time, plus everything you plant the second time to come up. And they're going to be a little bit uneven, and they're going to be too thick. And is that going to make your beans yield less? Maybe not. Uh, but it's probably not necessary to do that. And you know, like I say, you, you could, in hindsight, you could find situations where you wait and you wait and you wait and you end up replanting anyway. And, and that's the example you would use to prove Adam and I wrong that, well, you guys should have let me do what I wanted to do. I should have done that two weeks ago. But more often, I think you, you know, if you wait, you'll see that that stand is going to be fine. It doesn't need to be replanted. You can leave it alone and, and it'll probably be better being left alone. I, I, I can't tell you the number of times in my career I've had a guy tell me that at harvest time, you know, that I almost replanted this field because they didn't come up very good and they ended up being my best beans. So, so that probably wouldn't have happened if you would have thickened them up. You, you probably would have made them yield less by thickening them up. Plus, you've gone to the effort to do it. So I, I believe in giving beans a chance. Uh, beans will amaze you. Um, I don't care. You know, people, I had a guy ask me, um, you know, what, 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 what's the longest amount of time you can wait for beans to come up? And, and I, you know, I, I know one year when a guy planted some beans on February 16th and they tracked them took them 58 days to come up. So I said, you got to wait at least 58 days because that's how, that's how long I know a soybean can last in the soil. He didn't like that answer. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but you, you I mean, uh, th three weeks is nothing. You know, a, a, a month is starting to be, you know, concerning. But if you've had beans on the ground for three weeks and they're healthy and their necks aren't broke, I, don't worry about it. Um, you know, we catch a little shower, it warms up, they're going to come right through and, and you're going to have a great stand and, uh, and, and you'll see that it really wasn't worth worrying about, but I, I, I get it. It's stressful. So, <clears throat> you know, corn, if you got unemerged corn plants that are leafed out or the, the spike is starting to split or the spike, the spike is starting to bend over, uh, or you got, you know, some, some brown on the mesocotyl or you got brown sick looking roots. You know, I, it's okay to, to give up on those plants. And if, and if that's what you're finding below ground when you dig and you've got less than 30,000, like we were talking about, that are up, not many more are going to come up. And so you have to decide, am I satisfied with what I got? 
because if that's what you find when you dig, you aren't going to add many more to what you've got up. Um, now, if you're finding plants that still have good spikes, you know, you might get maybe 50% of what's not emerged to add to the total you've got. So, you know, if you got 25,000 up and there's 10,000 still coming and you get half of the 10, that's going to get you to 30. You're, you're probably okay. Not great, but it's okay. And, you know, back to our chart, our chart would say you're not going to gain. The chart would actually say you could lose by, by replanting that stand. So I think there's, there's probably, and this always happens every year, there's corn that should have been replanted that's not. There's corn that didn't need to be replanted that gets replanted uh, and, and everything in between. Hey, we got a couple of questions. All right, <clears throat> popping in here. Um, Jordan had one earlier. He wanted to know how many units of nitrogen do you recommend for corn on corn, uh, and is side dressing more important in corn on corn versus corn after soybean? So the the old classic recommendation is, and this kind of goes back to the infamous poorly named doesn't exist soybean credit. Um, but but the, the number typically associated with a soybean credit was 40 units. And that, in theory, would mean that corn on corn would need 40 units more nitrogen than rotated acres. I personally think the difference is a little more than 40 units. It's not due to a soybean credit. It's due to a corn on corn penalty. And, and I give Adam's former boss, Dr. Bilo, credit for, for coining that phrase of corn on corn penalty. Uh, would be a better term than soybean credit because soybean credit implies the soybeans are leaving nitrogen for the following year's corn crop for them to use. That is absolutely not the case. Does not happen. Uh, soybeans use more nitrogen than than they leave in the soil. But uh, I would say 40 to 50 units more for corn on corn would be my number. And and your follow up question, Jordan, about is is side dressing a good way to get that additional nitrogen that you need. So <clears throat> I'm never going to say that side dressing is bad. Um, you know, side dressing is probably something that all of us should, should do more of than we do. It's just one of those things that it's not easy. It's extra effort. It doesn't always yield more. It doesn't always make your nitrogen more efficient. And so you can always find reasons to talk yourself out of doing it because it's kind of a pain. Personally, I think the time that corn on corn needs more nitrogen is right at planting more so than in that side dress timing. So where I really want to have some extra nitrogen in my corn on corn is I, I want some, some readily available, either UAN or, or maybe urea uh, applied either with the planter at planting or very soon after planting, maybe a broadcast application, maybe a banded application, do it however you like to offset the nitrogen tie-up that's going to occur when that soil warms up, wakes up, and, and we get that flush of microbial activity and they start breaking down those corn stalks that are out there. That's going to suck all the available nitrogen out of the soil. Your anhydrous, which is probably your base nitrogen, that corn plant's going to be probably V5, V6 before it knows that that anhydrous is even there. So until its roots get down into that nitrogen band, it's going to be living off what it can find in the soil. And if you don't put some out there for it, it's not going to find much in the soil because the microbes are going to tie it up before the corn plant has a chance to take it up. So, so I think a, a really good time to put more nitrogen on your corn on corn is in that pre-plant, like if you're doing like a weed and feed with the UAN as a carrier, you know, if, if I want to use 50 units more nitrogen on my corn on corn, you know, I think that that's a good time to put that extra nitrogen out there. Side dressing is great. Um, you know, I, I, I would not want to wait to side dress time to put nitrogen on corn. Uh, so let's say you've got 140 units down as, as anhydrous. And let's say you want to put 60 more out there. Um, I'd kind of hate to wait to, you know, V4 to put my other 60 units on. Um, I, I would have rather had them on at planting than at V4. So if you want to side dress, I think we probably need to consider putting on less in the fall 
So we can still do the spring UAN and side dress. So, so that three application system would actually be my favorite. And, and, and I've broke it down this way as half, quarter, quarter. So, so this would be your fall. This would be your spring planting. And this would be side dress. So, so if you want to design a, a nitrogen program that has probably the best odds of being the best in any given year, I think that would be a, a really good program to have. Now, if it's a if it's a dry fall, dry winter, dry spring, there's not a damn thing wrong with putting it all on up front. Uh, but if we get a wet fall, warm winter, wet spring, then putting it all on up front can be can be really bad. So it's going to depend on the weather and and lots of factors in your soil, how much nitrogen your soil can supply. Um, but but that's a that, that's a pretty good program there, and and then and then the only question is, you know, how much, which that's a that's a topic for a, for another a, a, another whole episode is figuring out how much, and that that's about that's about as bad as the replanting decision because you know one one guy's how you know how much is one sixty, and another guy's is two hundred, and somebody else is two ten, and somebody else is one fifty, and they could all be right in any given year, hell, there's years where zero is, is the right rate. If you're on some really good high organic matter soil, hard to sell zero. Nobody, nobody believes that. It's easy to pay for zero, but it's hard to sell. <clears throat> okay. Was, was there another question or was there two, yeah, two from Jordan? Yeah, Gordon, uh, Gordon chimed in and he was wanting to know your thoughts on the value of in beta. Ah, okay. So, so I believe I'm not an expert. I, I believe that's Gromark's um, biological nitrogen. Yeah, I would nitrogen call it. Fixing. Yep. So, so that would be in the same vein of products as as proven from from Pivot Bio, kind of doing the same thing in a different way. Uh, I have seen test results on both of those products that that, that showed positive results. I've seen test results that show no response. And, and everything in between. Um, I, I know people that have used that product and have really liked it. Um, I, I would say more people that I've talked to that have used it have thought they saw a benefit from Invita than, than did not. So I would not discourage you from doing some work with it, trying it. I had, don't have any personal experience with it myself, but it's been, it's been a very popular product. It's, it's been supply limited because it's been hard to meet demand with it. People that have used it have tended to want to use more, uh, and, and generally that's a that's a good you know that, that's a good trend to have. Must must mean people are liking what they see. So <clears throat> those those products, um, it kind of depends on. A lot of those products are promoted as nitrogen replacement products, um, and, and that's a little bit where the where the discussion lies is because. As I talk to growers, I see people having more success with those products as using them in addition to nitrogen rather than in place of nitrogen. So, so sometimes those products are sold to replace a portion of your nitrogen and, and they're priced to, to enable you to do that. And if you don't reduce your nitrogen rate, you may think your costs are too high. In some cases, your 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 yield response is better if you use that product in addition to your traditional nitrogen program rather than cutting your traditional nitrogen program. Now that depends on you know what is your traditional nitrogen program, how much are you using? You know, if you're over applying nitrogen, you know, it's always easy to cut. If you're kind of a you know using a bare bones level of nitrogen. I would probably recommend trying those products as an additive to what you're doing rather than a replacement for part of your nitrogen. Um, so I, I, I would you know, proceed cautiously with those, especially if you're cutting your nitrogen rate, do some trials. Trials on that stuff are easy to do. You know, if you, if you cut out 40 units of nitrogen and use a product in place of that, it's fairly easy to compare that side by side to you know, the same rate of nitrogen with, without that product or you know, 40 units more without that product and, and just see what you see on your farm. Now, I will, I will give you the same caution I give everybody. 
if you do something one time in one field and you see a huge response, remember that was one time, one field. If you do something one time, one field and you see no response, remember that was one time, one field. So, so you, that's the challenging thing as a farmer, you may want to do your own testing and I encourage farmers to do their own testing. I also encourage them to ignore the results sometimes because it's one farm, one field. And, and that's the challenging part. Now, if we could get a hundred guys to do the same thing and then pool all that data together. And, and we've tried to do some of those type of initiatives to, to try to learn more about products. It's, it's challenging to do because you're, you're all, uh, extremely independent folks, and you're all doing things a little bit different. So sometimes it's hard to pool that data across farms. But um, but I you know very very much a fan of trying things on the farm and seeing what you see. Uh, we don't really endorse you know people's products here very often, so I'm I'm not giving an endorsement to any products. But I certainly like the idea of try it, test it, you know, see what you think on your farm, but just, just realize that with any biological product, um, the, the nature of a biological product is they, there's a lot of variability there just because you don't, you don't really know, you know, do you, do you need more nitrogen than the plant's got or do you not? And if the plant didn't need more nitrogen and you give it more nitrogen, you're not going to get a response. Um, so, so that's, uh, I guess those would be my thoughts. Thanks for the question, Gordon. With that, we had the uh, LP20 just hoping for some warm days and a light rain. Yeah. Fix a lot of yeah. A lot of anxiety, yeah. hopefully, and yeah. a lot of stands out there. But other than that, we don't have any more questions at yeah. the moment. We're cracking right yep. on 830. It, yep, we're we're at uh, we're at time here. So I, I I had a whole list of things I was gonna get into that we didn't get into, but that's okay. We had a good conversation. I will uh I will announce that I think later on this week, our, our next episode of The Agronomist Ass will, will be out with, uh, I believe my guest on that episode is, uh, is my colleague, Nicole Steckland, who is a TA in uh, East Central Iowa and kind of a social media uh, starlet, I would, uh, I would say. She, she'd be mad when I call her a starlet. But uh, she, she's on TikTok. She's on Twitter. She's, she's, she's out there. Very creative person. A lot of fun. Uh, and, and a very good agronomist and good mom too, by the way. Um, so, so I very much look forward to uh, that episode airing. And uh, she's also very involved in the uh, the Field of Dreams uh, game, uh, Major League Baseball game that uh, DeKalb has been sponsoring the last couple of years. And and we talk about that a little bit in our uh, interview as well. So, with that, uh, two weeks would be what the 18th. So May 18th. Um, Hopefully by then planting is done. Everything has emerged. We have emerged from this long, cold winter. Uh, one of these days it's going to be 90 and we're going to wish it was 65 again. Uh, we'll probably go from winter to, to summer and kind of skip right past spring is the way this year is kind of feeling to me. But I, I, I echo uh, the comments from the, from the listener that uh, we need some warm weather and a little shower would, uh, would make everybody feel better. I, uh, I think there's some corn being planted currently that's going to need some rain before it even comes up. So we did not get into a planting depth uh, dissertation today. I had intended to. We'll, we'll save that for another day because uh, because you shallow planters that uh, your corn's looking good this year. Um, that bothers me. So uh, so we'll talk more about that on a uh, on another episode. But um, thanks for your questions. Thanks for your time. Everybody stay safe. And uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks.